now to move to something which I'm sure is even more controversial. How can it be? The uh, five-year affordable housing production program from the city of San Jose, California. And we have, and thank you for coming, Leslie Crutko and Mike Meyer. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. In June of 2004, the city celebrated the fulfillment of a pledge to create 6,000 affordable units over a five-year period. Last week, just two years later, we celebrated the 10,000th unit, which will provide housing for more than 30,000 residents. San Jose pr pr excuse me, prides itself on its innovation. Growing from a prune capital in the 1950s to what is now the 10th largest city in the nation and known worldwide as the, Silicon of Sil uh, the capital of Silicon Valley. Um, but with that change came significant prosperity as well as significant disparity. 24% of the, of the city's residents pay more than 50% of their, their income on housing. The average 1,400 square foot house costs 750,000. It takes an hourly wage of $23 to afford the average two bedroom unit. Business leaders name affordable housing and housing as their number one problem in retaining and attracting uh, workers, and the public consistently lists housing among its top concerns. When Mayor Gonzalez uh, entered office in 1999, he challenged the housing department to double the rate of production of affordable housing. As a first step, he, he uh, established a blue ribbon task force comprised of business leaders, developers, and advocates. The result was a report that included 72 separate recommendations to increase development opportunities, remove barriers, and streamline the development process. One of the most far-reaching ideas was to enable and encourage housing construction on industrial campus land in North San Jose, home to many of the city's driving industries, including eBay and Cisco Systems. This idea improves the area's land use by allowing higher density industrial buildings alongside high-density high residential housing, creating worker-friendly villages and increasing the city's housing capacity by 30,000 units. 6,000 of these units will be affordable. The City Council approved the task force report, and of the 72 recommendations, 97% have been implemented. The task force laid the foundation for a five-year plan that fundamentally changed the city's approach to affordable housing development, from reactive to proactive, from responding to proposals from the development community to identifying and facilitating opportunities for development, from a focus as the city uh, as a regulator to one of partner. I'll highlight a few particularly effective and replicable examples of the city's approach. First, the city manager implemented a number of internal procedural reforms, beginning with the creation of a development cabinet made up of staff from the highest levels of government that met on a biweekly basis. The cabinet enables rapid and coordinated response to significant land use and development proposals. At the program level, the city created an interdepartmental housing action team comprised of line staff that meet regularly to coordinate and fast track review of affordable housing development proposals. Previously, the process was linear and developers had to move through several stages from planning review to plan inspection to fire safety and then to public works. This led to time delays and inconsistent direction by staff. The housing action team significantly shortened the timeline by making the process a one-stop action. In fact, the effort proved so successful that the city replicated the process for commercial development through its one-star processing center. We also embarked on a site-by-site -site analysis of land located throughout the city's 177 square miles to identify new opportunities for the development of high-density housing. This effort, called the Housing Opportunity Study, focused on transit corridors where land could be rezoned for transit-oriented development. The city then initiated zoning changes, eliminating the time and risk for housing developers. The study identified over 250 acres of land that could be, accommodate over 8,300 new housing units. To date, over 3,000 units have been built, including 500 affordable homes. To further mitigate barriers developers face, the housing, and also to help elected officials educate their constituencies, the city also created a novel anti-NIMBY campaign. Called the Faces and Places of Affordable Housing, the city developed printed materials and a video to address the myths and facts about affordable housing, showing that the housing produced is high quality and a benefit to neighborhoods. The campaign also includes educational material for use in public school classrooms. This program has helped significantly by ensuring that by the time proposals reach the city council, most public opposition has been addressed. To maximize the use of limited local funding, the city took several actions. 
First, we set a leveraging ratio of three to one and aggressively pushed to keep the city's subsidy low. Working with a state debt agency, the city helped create an innovative statewide program to issue taxes and bonds rather than taxable bonds, increasing the amount we could borrow by $20 million. In December, this program was awarded the Bond Deal of the Year Award by Bond Buyer Magazine. Thank you. Yes, Ed. I got to tell you, this uh, program, commendable as it is, gives me a, a little heartburn given the nature of the problem. That is, when the average house costs $750,000, it seems to me that a strategy of building a few thousand as affordable housing units is probably like paddling upstream with a very small oar. And I'm wondering whether you've thought beyond uh, this commendable but uh, nevertheless modest, modest in terms vis-a-vis -vis the fundamental economic distortion that you're dealing with. We're, we are always thinking beyond what we're doing now and looking to the next thing that we need to do. And the problem certainly is, is large. The, the majority of what we fund is rental housing because it, it is impossible to, to move people, especially lower income households, into ownership housing in our region. So what we're trying to do is ensure that people don't pay more than 30% of their income on rent. Uh, this past uh, year we surpassed uh, our statewide goals for housing production. That's something very few communities in California can say. And uh, we uh, intend to continue that. In fact, when I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we celebrated our 10,000th unit, we expect that that number by the end of this year will be 11,500. So we are tackling it, and, and uh, whether we'll solve it in the next uh, you know, five years or 10 years or 20 years, I don't know, but we, we intend fully to keep looking at new ideas and new ways to do that. Other questions? Yes, Bill Klinger. Yeah, I'd be interested in describing a little bit how you managed to avoid the NIMBY bullet uh, with the uh, because is it because they were they're smaller, discrete units rather than a larger uh, installation, or what reasons are No, there? in fact, they're not necessarily small at all, and they're high quality. Um, and I will say that, that really this is a great example of how success breeds success. Uh, the projects that we've built are um, very attractive and an asset to any neighborhood. In fact, one of our strongest um, uh, the components of our anti-NIMBY campaign is actually to bring neighbors to previously developed affordable housing projects so they can see the high quality. And once those folks understand that it's in fact their children who may be able to move into this high quality housing, um, it really changes minds and perceptions. Other questions here? Let me, can you walk me through just from a homeowner standpoint what, what it is, who's the average person who might take advantage of this and what kind of subsidy are they getting, just so I can, I can understand it. Um, again, the majority of our funds go to, to assist people with rental housing, but we do have a, okay. a home ownership program. And what kind of, what's a, what, what, is there somebody, how, how high end can the income of the person be who comes into your program? Well, we have a very high median income in San Jose. Our median income for a family of four is 105500 So, you, wait a second. so you've, got a, you've got families with $100,000 incomes, right? That can qualify for can a second qualify mortgage for, assistance. For, yeah. for assistance through this program. Well, again, the majority of what we're talking about, our 6,000 units here, are rental units. We, right. have, uh, we have a home ownership program as well that provides second mortgage assistance largely to teachers. We, did, uh, we have housed more than 500 public school teachers in the last five years through our public school teacher program. But those That's numbers right. weren't included in this, in this uh, application. In this application. So the people included in this application you know, for us to, to provide an award for a, a program that provides subsidized housing for teachers to live in their own community where they're teaching, one can understand that's why enormously appealing. But help me understand whether, I think for a lot of Americans who will gag on the notion that we ought to be given an award to, just to some to giving subsidies to people who earn $100,000. Well, and that's, that's not what this application is. This application is for our rental housing program, and that is capped at 60% of median income, and the majority of our units are for, for very low-income families. In fact, right now we have a, um, a policy 
that 25% of the units we assist are extremely low income. And in that, era, in that range, that's about $30,000 for a family of four living in an area where the average income exceeds $100,000. Okay. Um, as as I think we said, we have a lot of high incomes from our internet millionaires, and uh, we have sure. people on fixed income as well, and we need to account for them. So if, if, if we were to select this program, our, the argument would be that this is for a segment of the population between thirty dollars and $50,000 income, and this allows them to, to live in the, in the cities in which they work. Is, that the, is this the argument, the central argument? Absolutely, and, it, and it's uh, the kind of housing that we need for our employers. But I'd also arg argue that the reason why we've submitted this is because we feel that we have a lot of tools uh, that we have used to increase production that other communities can use to do the same. So uh, w maybe without having additional financial resources, uh, available to them, that there are some other things that we can show them they can do to increase what they're doing today. Okay. 